Have you been considering an onboard air system for your Jeep JT Gladiator, but are unsure about what application to go with to ensure convenience of access, protection from the outdoor elements, and theft? Well, look no further because 813 Fabrication and Designs has developed a behind the rear seat bracket for your single or twin ARB compressor that checks all those boxes. Sure, if you're not wanting to go with a permanent solution, there are plenty of portable units out there to consider as well. But whether you're airing up and down off-road, running power tools at the job site or on the trail, or heck, even wanting to inflate mattresses or beach toys, having an air system available for your vehicle is probably one of the most utilitarian upgrades you can do for your adventure or construction site vehicle. Want to see how we did it? Stay tuned. <laughs> Hey, welcome back to another video here on the Gator Overland channel. I'm John, and in today's video, we'll be doing the install and evaluation of the 813 Fabrication and Design Gladiator Specific behind the rear seat mount for your ARB single or twin air compressor, as well as the optional dual chuck rocker switch panel that replaces the Jeep bolt storage bin underneath the rear seat. New to the aftermarket industry and based out of Louisville, Kentucky, 813 Fabrication and Design specializes in CNC laser cut molly panels as well as air compressor bracketry and other aluminum metal works. In today's video, I will also be going over the interior trim removal steps as well as a detailed how to wire to your ARB rocker switch or for those of you equipped, how to wire to your in-dash auxiliary group. And for those of you watching who are not JT owners or Jeep owners for that matter, you might want to stick around because you might find the wiring portion of this video helpful for your own vehicle application. And for your time-saving convenience, check the description below as I'll have timestamps for the whole process of the installation as well as links to websites and items used to complete this project. I went with a single air compressor for my situation because, as you can see, my tires are in a stock configuration. I may upgrade to 37s later on, but right now I'm a flatlander and rarely have need to air down, but I like having the convenience for doing it. Those of you who are run 35 inch tires or above, plan to use high torque air tools, or plan on resetting a bead should you knock one off, you definitely want to go with the twin system for your kit. Now that all that's said, I almost need a compressor to get all of it out, let's go get this thing installed. Ever since we began our Overland build with our JT, I have been brainstorming, searching, sourcing any and all options for mounting an onboard air compressor, specifically an ARB, to the vehicle, whether it be in the bed of the vehicle, the cab of the vehicle, or under the hood of the vehicle. All of them have their advantages and disadvantages, but 813 really stepped up to the plate with this design, utilizing a space under, otherwise unused in the vehicle other than storage, and it allows you to mount your air compressor behind the driver's side back seat. Up, out of the way, secure, not have to worry about anything. It's really nice, rigid construction of aluminum, lightweight and strong. It's gonna be great inside the vehicle. This is another option you can go with for, it's a switch bracket, or a bracket for a switch plate. And if you're unfamiliar with it, underneath the Jeep's back seat, there is a storage compartment that holds all the fasteners and bolts for your doors, things like that. What 813 has done is they've provided all the same amount of holes, plus they have the two spots for your air chuck couplers right here and your ARB switch. In our process, we will be using the ARB switch. Some of you have the opportunity to use an auxiliary switch inside your dash. This is not necessary in that case. But as you can see, 813 design has provided a really well-documented labeled fasteners and a really good manual for installation. I will say I'm not affiliated with 813. Jeremy, you're a nice guy. Thanks for all your help and information about this in the process of ordering. I know this is going to be a really popular kit and let's get it installed. With the plan to mount the compressor on the back driver's side behind the rear passenger seat, I figured the best method would be to protect the wires by running it through the actual body trim here. If your JT or JL is equipped with the auxiliary group, then you might want to run the power to the wires provided. There's also another set of wires on the battery side of the firewall, but all you have to do is go up underneath here. This is the driver's side of the passenger footwell on the transmission bell housing. Just up here, there is a set of wires. That all you have to do is pull a little bit. There'll be a set of electrical tape up there. You can pull back slightly and it will reveal this loom here. You'll have, of course, you'll want to refer to your owner's manual, but you'll have a set of wires here, you know, 240 amps and 215 amps, and then some other accessory wires going through. 
So what you'll want to do is select out the ones that go to auxiliary switch 3 and 4, which are the 15 amp, if you're planning on running your compressor from the auxiliary group. I am not. I'm going to be using the 813 switch bracket with the air compressor coupler on it. So this is going to go back up for me. With that said, we're going to go through the trim. If you're familiar with removing the doors, then this is the first step typically but a lot of people get this wrong they want to remove the molding this way this is not the case in this case it's actually towards the rear of the vehicle you pop it out it's actually got a really nice tether right there you have your strap right here which is also the wire loom to the door powering the door so what you'll do is you'll just lift up you might have to push the door in just a little bit and get that loop up off it is retained by this retainer right here, the spring retainer that positions the door, but you don't want to have a wind gust putting any strain on that. Then the next step is to pop up this red switch right here, which is a keeper. It's a little red switch. And then this is actually a cantilever uh, mechanism that keeps them from separating. What you want to do, this is the wiring to the door. You want to disconnect that. So. We've done both of those and that thing just pops off and you'll stick that into the webbing on the side of the door or at least that's what I do. Now you're totally disconnected with the door. If you were taking off the doors, you're done with that. There's a 10 millimeter nut that needs to come off before this molding can come off as well as the actual switch coupler itself that will have to be moved before you can remove this molding. So take a 10 millimeter and remove that fastener there. I've already got most of it done get that out of the way this would be a good time to remove your floor mats that way your molding and everything is out of the way at the same time with a flathead screwdriver you can run right up through depress and then that slides down a little track and then you are completely removed from that now that you have all your material this is dangling this is disconnected you have your 10 millimeter nut moved out of the way it's just a forceful push towards the driver side and you should be able to get your molding off. There it goes like that. And then as you move down towards the rear of the vehicle, there's an actual split just next to the driver's side that is a set of two teeth. And then once you get that undone, it's pretty much a really easy process after that. Just like that, and you reveal pretty much everything there it comes out it's pretty simple just like that now that we have that out of the way we're going to work our way around the seat belt buckle and towards the rear of the vehicle you also want to take and do this particular shroud right here which covers up where the seat belt connects and it's just as simple as pushing it back this way it definitely goes the same way direction towards the inside the clips go towards the seat and we'll slide this forward if you haven't already done so, go ahead and remove or fold back your factory floor mats. Some people will have fabric ones. In my case, I have the weather floor mats. And we're just going to fold them back out of the way. All right, despite the other position at the front where it's pulling back motion for the door panel, this one actually is going to be out at the bottom and it clips in at the top and it has a tether as well. All right, now that we got this part tether out of the way we're going to go ahead and just give a forceful blow to the side of the vehicle and this one thing comes out as one full piece there's two pieces here two clips here and they go straight into the side of the trim and as mentioned this is tethered this is what you would have to remove to remove your doors we're going to continue on with removing the trim as you can see, there is a seam right here. There's actually two white clips, one above the other, that are right here in line. You pull this like this, pull back your wiring, and now you can see, and it reveals up underneath the two white clips that would go into the mating two female sides right there. And now you have access to run your wires. Now that we have all our trim removed from the inside of the passenger side of the vehicle, you're probably curious where the wire loom is gonna pass through the vehicle. No, nope, we're not planning on drilling through the firewall. We're actually gonna go right up into here. There's this nice rubber grommet with the main power line hose going through it. I'll show it on the other side of the firewall, how easy it is. And we'll run the, the main red and black wire 
from the compressor to the battery and the signal wire that we're going to use to the F50 fuse in the fuse box. But it's just a little rubber boot right there. I might be able to pierce or even pull this down far enough to run both of those back there. But other than that, that's the plan. And this is in the passenger footwell. We've just completed removing all the interior trim pieces, getting them out of the way so we can run our wire loom. Now it's time to prepare our path for running the wire loom. I considered running everything from based out of underneath the hood, but at this point in time, it's actually unnecessary because we have this flimsy inner liner right here, and it's only held in by a few Christmas trees and a few brads up on the inside of the fender flare right here. So go ahead, run down to an auto parts store and get you a set of Christmas trees. I'm not sure the actual technical term for them, but they are a trim push tab and you will ruin them by removing them, but you just clip them on the back side here and here. I'm going to pull that in right here and then all this will fold forward and it exposes everything electrical on the inside of the firewall which is perfect you don't necessarily have to go through there at least you can plumb all your wires up through and then whenever you're ready to go up to the battery you can go up that way but that's just a step that I'm going to do Everything you see here comes inside your air compressor box. You got your air compressor, you got your main power loom, which has the big thick wires as well as your relays and your fuses, and then you have a little switch loom right here. Now, don't let all this wiring get you discouraged because you'll find out that it's actually really simple. For the guys that have to use the air lockers and the solenoids, that's what all the rest of this stuff is for. So you'll find that if you go through the schematic here, if you have a single like I have, all you need is the main red wire to go to a 12 volt power source. You have a twin, you need the main purple wire to go to a 12 volt power source. Whether you're using your auxiliary group, a switch behind the panel like I'm going to use, uh, running to a fuse or directly to the battery if you wanted to do it that way. But the matters of this video, I'm going to quickly go over exactly what you need and what you don't need. So this right here, all you have to do is, is that simple? Actually no, set aside about 10 to 15 minutes of pulling off all this electrical tape. But let's get down to breaking down the wiring to showing exactly what you need. Now that we have all the electrical tape removed from the wire harness, it's really easy to see how simple the wiring system is. You have your main positive and negative wire that run through on up through a fuse and split and then go up to a relay. This split plugs directly into the air compressor side. It'd be the same with the twin. And then the relay comes out of there this is essential wires, by the way. The blue wires is an essential wire, and it connects to the pressure switch, just like that. Now, here's where you get to make your decision on how you power the unit, because it only comes down to one wire. You guys with the auxiliary option, you can use number three or number four to provide power to this side of the switch. You don't need anything else right here. Just all this wiring harness is just not necessary. Now, if you're gonna use an actual switch, you will have to have a source of power, which I'm gonna use the F50 fuse that goes into the back of the switch here. And then you will need a red wire, same red wire that runs through this whole thing right here and connects to this particular plug and you're good to go. All the rest of the colors here are not necessary. Green and yellow are both for solenoids for the guys who are using air lockers. And the black ground is only to ground to illuminate the lights. If you're not planning on using the light inside the switch, that's not necessary. So it's as simple as running the power source, red and yellow wire, which you would get from the fuse box, in, and then a red wire out to the switch. Auxiliary group would connect right here. You don't have to use any of this loom. If you're using a twin, you would connect, this, this pressure switch is all behind the actual case unit, there will be a purple wire that comes out of the main wire loom that connects to your stuff. It'll be on the back. The purple wire you will remove and connect directly to your auxiliary three or four. And that's as simple as powering your unit. All right, what you see here is the switch loom, the one that powers the actual ARB switch. If you're using the auxiliary group, you won't need to do any of this. You would just discard any of this. But to make the loom simple, there was a bunch of extra wires for the other actuators of the solenoids for the air lockers. I removed those from the actual connector themselves. Now, this is the blue and white wire. It's illumination. If you want the switch to turn on and have a light, you'll have a light that says compressor there 
and then whenever you turn it on that'll turn into a big blue light there the other two that were here were for the switches that go to the air lockers don't need those so i cut them and then covered it up with a shrink wrap now the red wire this was for the actuation of the other switch over here you can cut that shrink wrap as well now these are the two grounds that will actually go to the back of the switch if you want to illuminate the other ones are for the switches if you want to illuminate those you won't need any of that so that's what it would look like if you wanted to use the switch and illuminate it once you've laid your seat down all you have to do is take this rubberized mat out of the way and get a 10 millimeter socket or a wrench go down there and quickly adjust those fasteners remove those out of the way there's only two and they're not very tight Now, let's go get our air compressor mounted to the bracket. You will have to mount the compressor to the bracket before it goes into the vehicle. Now that we got the interior prepared for the install of the bracket, we're gonna go ahead and mount the air compressor to it. Now, I've already gone through trial and error and figured out a few things that are kind of an inconvenience. So I will note, if you plan on using the ARB hardware, the fastener hardware, these bolts are gonna be too long to be able to work with this bracket without pushing into the back side of the blue shroud here. And the reason why that's an issue is because you can't put the bolts as you have an option, one with a head that slides into the bracket and they're fixed to where you don't have to worry about them spinning. But the problem is whenever you mount it to the bracket through here, they stick too far out and they push up against the back wall of the truck. You can't have that. So the bolts actually have to go in through this side. Well, in the process of doing that, I figured out that once you get them through, they actually come too close to the inside of here and end up pressing on the inside of that bracket, even through all that stuff. So a quick trip down to the hardware store. You will need to get some M6 by 16 millimeter bolts to work with this. That will allow you enough room to be able to put on a nut and fasten it all together. Or if you have the proper tooling, you can snip or trim these down. In my case, I don't have that, so I went ahead and just got their 35 cents a piece. Noted. Jeremy, <laughs> I don't know if he's going to start including these in his kit, but if you're using the single compressor, you will need a M6 by 16 to work with the bracket. Now, as far as the bracket goes for the ARB, there are four points here that have rubber grommet bushings to where it helps out with vibration. You take your four millimeter Allen key, we're going to remove these four bolts. That way we can have the bracket completely separate from the pump. And we're going to mount the bracket to this bracket and then put the pump back on. That's where my problem was beforehand. I got this mounted up there, went to put the bracket on and I couldn't do it because it bottomed out against the provided ARB screws. It's nothing as far as the design flaw on the bracketry from 813. It's just that the bolts provided are too long. This should come off. As you can see, there's some rubber grommets in there, and that's for vibration. Now, ARB only provides a set of four washers here, and he has these slots. I'm gonna utilize this. I don't know, it doesn't say in the, the manual or the instructions to install to use washers or anything, but I noticed whenever I was putting the bolt heads through, that they're just shy of the slot and they kind of cockeye a little bit like that. I don't want that fit in there. Washers is what would be needed for that. But in this case, because it takes up no more space, we're gonna go ahead and install this plate here. Now we have that. We're gonna take the ARB bracket, just like that. Let's see if I can do this without them all falling out. But we have plenty of room to put on our washer now. Get the top one done. Put on our washer and our nut. All right, have everything loosely fastened on here to where we can move this around into whichever way. And what I'm gonna do is you can see how there's a little bit of the slot there. I'm gonna make it to where it looks, and there's a little bit of slot there. I'm gonna make it to where it just slightly exposed both slots. That way you know you're pretty good, square and even. 
and it's really nice considering this little plate was provided in the ARB because it lines up everything and you don't have to worry about them flopping around. So we're going to fasten this up now. We've got everything where we want it and I figure if I put it just up in the middle it won't be so close to the bottom of the bracket plate in the case that it contacts. I don't want any sound of vibration of the pump up against the bracket itself. And this is just going to be German torque specs, which means good and tight. <laughs> now we have our bracket there. It's time to fix this. I have the collar, of course, I mentioned earlier with a four millimeter Allen key. You can loosen up, and this collar will move back and forth and allow you to position your manifold in the right way. The way we want it. I want to have access to these points. If I have it this way with it folded up, the Allen keys, there is no access because the manifold's in the way. So what we're going to do is going to fold it this way where they're at the bottom, Allen keys going down. We're going to put in our little pieces here. So as you can see, we have the four studs in here, one, two, three, four mounted. We have our mounted plate here. There's the inside of the nuts on the inside. It helps if you do it separately from the compressor. Now, I haven't tightened up the collar, this blue collar just yet, because we want to get this air manifold in the right position. So now that this is all the way up there, it's good to go. I'm going to stop it from just touching the bracket, come back just a little bit forward. Now, from this point, there is a air manifold right here at the top, and it's got a port on it. To loosen this, this thing can swivel this way as well. We're going to loosen this 10 millimeter bolt here. That's a tensioner. We're going to roll that cylinder towards the front. I've already gone and trial fit everything, so everything you see here is exactly what you need to run your single pump compressor. If you're going with a twin, the air pressure switch is actually internal between the two on a manifold, and all you would have to do is worry about connecting the purple wire. This is not necessary in the twin, but it is for the single for sure. One thing you need to pay attention to is whenever you order your chuck fittings, there's two different kinds. There's the JIC04 or the JIC04 and the NPT. If you're using the JIC04, this is what I recommend because it's a little bit more low profile. It has the collar for the bulkhead fitting built into it and you can go directly to the back. If you go with the NPT like I did initially, you'll have to get a bulkhead fitting. And they're inexpensive and that would actually adapt to the plate there. You might have to ream it out, that's why I have this right here and it would actually connect into there. But if you go with an NPT bulkhead fitting, it's gonna have NPT on the back side. You will need to go with an NPT to connect on the inside of there to the flare fitting to work with your JIC-04 fitting. This is a JIC-04 line, it's the three meter. This, if you didn't get an air kit that came with the manifold, this is the three way. And we're gonna put the pressure switch in this side and our 90 to uh, NPT 90 out like that. And then this is going to connect to both ends of the line. One here and one on the bottom here. So if you haven't already put Teflon tape on everything, go ahead and do that now. And we'll go over exactly how I put it together. A little Teflon tape pro tip. You take the tape in your right hand with your fingers pinched on it and going away from you. You take your fitting in your left hand, point it inside. And you lay the tape right over the top of it. And as you wrap, it actually tightens down. You don't have to worry about it being loose or fumbly, and that's it. Just make sure your orifice is clear. All right, to start off, we're gonna get our T manifold here, and we're gonna go NPT to JIC fitting right here. Try to get that faced opposite of this. We're gonna go in with our pressure switch. All right, when I'm done doing that, I'm gonna end up with 
a fitting setting just like this, where you have pressure switch out of the center of the T and then the 90 to the flare fitting. All right, we got that in there. I don't think you have to use the pressure switch separate. I was thinking that it might bump into the back of the bracket, but I was able to spin it in just fine with it all connected like that. So there you go, you're ready to go into the vehicle. We're gonna connect our JICO 4 fittings to the bottom of this right here, and then finish up, button it up on the inside of the vehicle, and that's that. Then we'll go over how to connect the switch. Before you button everything up, you wanna double check all your compression fittings with soapy water. That way you can see if you have any leaks and you can tighten as needed to fix the problem. All right, now what you're gonna do is you're gonna take the provided fastener set that they give, and basically these are just two threaded couplers coupling, I should say, and they're going to go down onto the existing studs. And you're going to go down there to pretty much just finger tight. All right, they're nice and tight now. We're going to come in with our compressor bracket. And it fits down right over on top. Everything's nice and flush. Just perfect. We're gonna go with our washer, slide it over into place. You take your small screw or small bolt with an Allen head. It's a four millimeter, just like all the other components. And we're going to see if I can get that down in there first. All right, that's it. We have our washers in place with the bolts, the brackets in, and that ain't moving. It is also not contacting the uh, the back here or anything like that. As you can see, I left in the netting. It still has a little bit in there, but it is the perfect angle. And don't forget to tighten up your four millimeter Allen screws that holds onto the shroud, because uh, it's kind of a tedious, Part, trying to get those fasteners in there but other than that all we have to do is figure out finally which way to position the manifold and then retighten our 10 millimeter nut all right on to the switch bracket what you'll need is the bracket base the bracket plate and then it's provided with four fasteners and washers first step we're gonna pull the box out which reveals the foam inserts if you already have bolts in there which I do these are from my front bumper doesn't really matter we're gonna pull that out you'll discard this there are two 10 millimeter fasteners here. We're going to go ahead and pull those out. They're not very tight. All right, and you can possibly see from that angle that white clip there. That is kind of a tension fastener there. That's, you just basically pull towards the driver's seat really hard and this bracket comes off. It just sits on that screw sitting there. Now that we've got that out of the way, we're going to save these 10 millimeter bolts. This bracket is gonna go back down where that was. And though there are three screws there, you are only gonna use these two. There, that fabric is a little bit too thick for me to be able to get it there. So what I'm gonna do I'm gonna cut this. I know, I know, it's no longer stock anymore, but it's a Jeep. What does it need carpet for anyway? I'm just going to snip that and fold those down out of the way, and maybe we can have enough access to put our plate in. Still a little bit shy. We're gonna go one step further and put it behind the carpet. See if that will allow us. Yes, that did it. All right, so now that we have that fastener there, this fastener is gonna go on no problem. It says in the instructions that this one just needs to be hand finger tight because you don't want to bend the bracket. It could distort the placement of the 
the holes here. So we're just going to give that a quick once over there. We're good and tight there. Let's double check our bracket lineup. Seems that everything's going to work out just fine. Now the fasteners you'll see, pardon my sweating, it's scorching outside. The smallest screw here is going to go in this back portion right here. The reason why that is is that the cab actually slants down and it needs a little bit more or less space in that section, but it's just enough to do that. We will also revisit this once we come to the wiring section because we'll have to do the hose and the ARB switch to show how that does. But that's as simple as that. What's really cool is this just pulls back right here. So there's no fishing the line. Basically, we're gonna go come out and come out right here. As you can see, I've come about every eight inches or so and put a loom kind of keeper retainer on there. So whenever I put the black plastic shroud over it, it'll all stay together and not want to pop out. All right, as you can see, we have it plumbed down and around and have it kind of an angle away from the switch here. And right here, you see all the switch wires that I have pre-done. I went ahead and spliced together the blue and white and the red and yellow splice there. This is providing power from the F50 fuse to the switch. This is providing power to the lights, but remember, you won't get any power to the lights unless you ground it. I decided that I was gonna go ahead and do that. So the red and yellow goes to the middle, like that. The blue goes to the bottom. It's the main red, power out to the pressure switch. Goes right next to the red and yellow. And the two black go here on the end. And that grounds your switch so your lights work. And that's that for wiring. Now let's get it down here into the plate. As you can see, I do have the relay and the, I believe that's a 40 amp fuse. That's gonna actually sit down here in this area and out of the way. That way I can access it if I need to. So for that matter, if I ever have a problem of blowing a fuse or the relay goes bad, they're right here, all within my electrical stuff. So I have extended the red and yellow power wire or power to the fuse panel with the on switch up in through the loom. As you can see, the red and blue wires there are going to the pressure switch. Wire loom is going back behind the seat bracketry underneath the carpet here, coming out of the wire loom right there. And as you can see, I'm on my final run to go down the side of the vehicle up to the battery area. There's the extra 10 gauge wire in case I run short. I'm obviously already at that point right now. This is going to come off and I'll be putting a splice connector there and a splice connector there. All right, as you can see, we've made our butt connector, double checked it. And I went ahead and got the waterproof one with the shrink wrap, it's not shrink wrap, heat shrink on it. I'm gonna go ahead and Nice, good, solid connection there. Waterproof, good to go. All right, as you can see, I've done the rest of the length of wire at about every six to eight inches. I've coupled it together with an electrical tape just to make it stay pretty tight. Now it's time to fish it through the firewall. And uh, man, they make fishing items and things like that for chasing wires and whatnot, but good coat hanger is what we're gonna use. I'm gonna see if it works out. So what we're gonna do is going up in the firewall, find that boot, poke this through the boot, get it through, and then follow it back with this and pull it all the way through. As you can see, I've successfully routed the wires through the rubber grommet in the firewall there. And I'm gonna follow up with pulling it out on the other side. This is from down underneath. There's the main wire loom, and it's coming in just over the top. I'm just gonna continue to pull it on. As you can see, the main wire loom goes up right to the battery tray. That's where we're gonna route this wiring, straight up through the battery tray. Now, as far as getting it underneath the trim, there's this little plate that holds down the main wire loom. 
there's three 10 millimeter bolts that I removed. I'll set those over here for now. And if you take to a flathead screwdriver to just depress into the little inlet there, there is a little tooth guide and you'll be able to pull this back just like that. And we're going to pop that loom just in there. Like it was factory. There's plenty of room for it. Then just snap them back down. And you're all good to go. Put your 10 millimeters back on and you're set. Time to go to the battery. All right, we have everything fished through from the firewall up through. I've zip tied it to the main wire loom down underneath the fender well and all the way up through to here. So as you can see right here, this extra length is actually gonna go to the F50 fuse panel right here. Do keep in mind, there is this tether right here that is your auxiliary group. You can connect it to that. Like I said, I didn't feel that it was worthy of just a 12 volt signal wire to take away from one of my auxiliary switches, but it to each their own. In fact, I did figure out that one of the wires that's on the interior of the auxiliary switch loom, there is an actual accessory with the key on, which is exactly what I'm hooking it into with the F50 fuse. If I could do it differently and not figure out that after I've already run the wire loom, I would have connected this wire to the accessory with the key on in the footwell. Uh, just keep that in mind. That's what I would do differently. Thing. Jeep planned ahead, knew that you were gonna put every accessory possible on their battery. So they've uh, got you two posts there. Unfortunately, two different sizes. One's a 13 millimeter and one's a 12. So have those ready to go. I'm gonna go ahead and fish these wires here. All right, I'm gonna pull this positive back because it's gonna go on right here. This black here, I'm going to attach to zip tie, just like the zip ties here. Gotta keep them from moving around. And what we have here is the main negative cable coming from the main connector on the side of the compressor and the main ground wire for the relay, which is also the ground wire to power the lights on the switch if you're using a switch. What we're gonna do here, we're gonna come a little bit further past. We're actually gonna splice these together. this and there we got our terminal connector that's going to go on just like that it helps to twist that way it kind of binds it up inside all right looks like we have a good connection there put it right there crank it down Give it a double check. All right, we have our black connector ready to go. All right, now for the positive. What I'm gonna do, again, I'm gonna run it just a little bit past where the terminal will connect. That way I can have a little bit of slack if I need to. But if you imagine that on there, put it back. I'm gonna go right there. most cases it's better to have and not need than need and not have and anything worth doing is worth doing it right so have that on there terminal is through that double crimp there we got a good positive there all right 
now we're going to zip tie this red one down. Good and tight. There we go. Got our wiring done to the battery. Back up and over. All right, everything looks pretty good. All right, moving right along to the pigtail fuse adapter. I've already got it crimped right here at the right distance to go. But what it is, is it allows you to adapt a secondary fuse line. As you can see, it comes out through the top. I'm gonna to put that guy in right there. It came equipped with a 15 amp fuse. It's definitely more than adequate for the little line. All we're using is a 12 volt signal wire to go back to the pressure switch. That way it operates the unit. 15 amps is plenty fine. But we need to find a spot in the fuse box here that is accessory with the key on. And I did a little bit of research and right here, F50 is actually the fuse for the auxiliary group. That's what we're gonna use. Now, most of you will probably use the switch for the auxiliary group. I couldn't see wasting a whole switch just for this little 12 volt signal wire. So this is what we're going to do. Jeep comes equipped with this cool little, well, I say all vehicles come equipped with a grabber. We're gonna pull that 10 amp out. And as you can see, that 10 amp's gonna go right in here at the bottom. And then this whole thing is gonna go right back in its place, just like that. We're gonna run this wire down and over the edge like that because the lid has a void in it, which will allow us to push straight down, no problem. But definitely don't forget to put your grabber back in the truck because you'll wish you had it. By the way, these are micro two fuses, not the micro, but the micro two very good to know because you'll buy the wrong ones if you don't know that and that's it all right moment of truth let's see if the switch works as you can see there is no illumination to the switch i did ground the back of the switch to a bolt that came on the new bracket as well as splicing in the blue and white illumination wire to the red and yellow wire that goes to the f50 fuse so by design there is no power to the switch until i turn the vehicle into the accessory or preferably the on with the engine running so for that matter let's give it a accessory switch now i have illumination and that turning off means the pressure switch inside, realize the manifold is full and there's no leaks. So for that matter, we're gonna turn it off. You don't wanna leave air in your line, so we're gonna use this little chuck here to relieve the pressure and pop that back out. And we'll turn off the truck again. Now you see the illumination has gone away and we have no power to that switch. That's a job well done. We're complete. my cue 30 psi love that tire fill alert option if you enjoyed today's video found it informative or helpful in making your decision to go with an onboard air system or how to wire one go ahead give us a big thumbs up let us know how we're doing for a heads up on any future installs or adventures select that subscribe button notification bell you can follow us along our journey i'm pretty excited about the next video it's going to be a self-equalizing four tire air inflate and deflate system set up just for our arb system we installed today don't forget to check the description below for timestamps and links to the websites and items we used today to install this kit. And remember, we at Gator Overland encourage each and every one of you to take a daily moment to unplug and reconnect with the outdoors, even if it's just for a few minutes. As always, we thank you for watching. Have fun, keep it safe, and just go. Thanks, y'all.